So hello everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this uh, research colloquium. Today we have an external invited speaker. His name is Stian Salian Reyes, and he works with the e-science lab in the University of uh, Manchester. He is very involved in communities related to, to metadata with the purpose of making research um, fair and reproducible. So even an open and so on. So even beyond uh, the, the fair principles. Today, Stian is going to talk about research objects. We know that there is a growing uh, discussion within the research community on effective ways to make research fair and not only data, I'm talking about different uh, research outcomes uh, elements that play a role within a uh, research cycle. So this is uh, what Stian will talk about today, research objects that cover kind of all the spectrum in a unified way via packages, just to gather the things together and really having them as a coherent unit. It is um, supported by semantic technologies because it uses uh, JSON, JSON LD. And there is also the possibility to get a persistent identifier, a DOI, for a research object package. So Stian will introduce us uh, to, to the subject and will give us some uh, examples. And hopefully, we will, a we will be able then to kick off and start using research objects. Uh, here at Seven Edge. So, Estian, thank you very much for joining us today. Just, just sorry, just one m tiny technical interruption. Um, I, can you check because some people couldn't get in? Okay, now they are. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leila, for the introduction. You basically said my whole talk now, so I'm I'm done. Can go home again. Uh, well, I'll try to say cover most of those things. So, I'll talk you through it. So. Uh, I don't really need to remind you about the fair principles of things, but I, I like to always bake in an annual reminder because it's not just those four letters. Remember, you remember there are a set of principles that has to do with metadata and how uh, you access this using identifiers, how things should be open and accessible. And interoperability is an important point of uh, fair particularly for knowledge representation, that somehow you, you structure the data and metadata so the computers can also access this. And that's basically the summary of the fair principles, make things accessible for computers, not just for, for humans. Now, I want to th bring up this uh, ever uh, appearing reproducibility crisis we're talking about. It's not as, as bad as it maybe you sometimes hear about, but it is, something that it keeps making it difficult for others to reuse your results to even understand if they are true or not. Because even when we move into a computational world, you would think, okay, we're running on a comp computer, it should be done, we already have everything there. Yet when we publish about this, like here's a nature paper that I actually quite admire because they have, this is a very big and, and thorough reproducibility section but you see there's lots of different command line tools and so on listed in here. Basically everything you see with caps lock in here is, is some tool. So there is a workflow in here or there's a way to run this analysis for yourself, but you have weeks ahead of you just trying to find the software to figure out how to wire them together and so on. So we have to move away from this way of just textually reporting what we're doing, particularly when we're doing computational analysis. And in this particular paper, there is actually not just a zip file attached, they have GitHub repository and so on. So people have become much better in, in sharing code that is used as well. But, but even here you see there are many different scripts and so on, and it is not easy to know where do we even start in here if I want to have a go with this. So this is the, the motivation for workflows. So workflows is a way of lifting that uh, composition of tools to something that we can reason about and do more clever computation about. So it's trying to solve this problem of basically, yeah, yeah, you can download the code, but how do you get it to run? You need to download the student as well to get it to work. So Reflux is trying to help you with that. So there's an element of automation to uh, 
make your workflow runnable and reusable because you have uh, parameterize how you do your inputs. And this, of course, is an advantage when you want to do scale up because you can now run it on many nodes on the cloud, for instance. Uh, there's also a level of abstraction. So you see just, just being able to produce diagrams like, like this one means you can explain what you're doing without necessarily having to read four paragraphs or go into the different uh, source code that is underneath. And there's also an element of provenance because you're now also keeping track of what you're doing rather than just doing it blindly without uh, recording anything. Now, the challenge is many people had this idea. So if I, we, we have a list for it, keeping track of well-known uh, well known workflow systems and the list goes to tr almost 300 now. In fact, this is from a few days ago, so I'm sure a few more have been added meanwhile. So that there's a challenge in that each of them are inventing things slightly different. Everyone is special, right? So there's always something different, but each of them really are talking about usually some way of executing commanding tools and passing files around. So this is the motivation for the common workflow language, which I have been involved with. So this is an attempt to make a workflow language that can be run by many different engines. So it's kind of neutral to the engine because it has this core uh, functionality, which is just, as I said, running some tools and passing files around. And this is the, the very simple example of a workflow. You see, we have quite a few different implementation and some are partial implementation because we have a modular specification for CDBL. That means you can implement it to a varying degree and still keep interoperability so that you're not trapped to one particular engine when you're running, but you can move your intellectual property, so to say, your computational method between ways of executing it. Now, I'll, has a second follow-up article also in Nature, where this interview with actually that person, the, the main author of that paper I saw before, and he's saying how when they moved to CDL, it means they could start collaborating more, even with this, uh, the people who were using totally different workflow system, because now you have the kind of common way of exchanging uh, execution details. And in particular, interesting for them was the ability not to share the workflow, but to share the tool binding. So this is how it's done in CDL, where you have, did you see the workflow on the left here, where you have links out to how to actually run each of these tools. So here you see, for instance, uh, that there's a metric one on the bottom is pointing to a, a separate file that then says how to do the actual command. So it has a binding between the inputs and how this passes into commands. And this is the thing that takes time because every command is doing these things differently, right? So to formalize these things as tools, then putting them together in a workflow is kind of the simple part because now you just, you have Lego blocks that you can put together. And here you also have the execution details using Docker container is now very common, which means you have captured off the whole uh, execution environment for that particular tool. But then each tool can have a different container and therefore you no longer have version conflicts and so on. And that helps against for reproducibility. So this is how many workflow systems are now doing it and, and in particular in CDBL, and that helps with also making your workflows move between different machines. Now, this is just one part of the, the kind of toolbox that we are developing for how to improve reproducibility, how to communicate science in a different way. So we want to move away from that PDF. We, you can add a workflow to, to kind of formalize how you put your tools together. Of course, you have some data sets and then there could be other ways of uh, analyzing and expressing these things like these slides I'm doing right now. But when you put them together in a black box, they're not connected together, right? So you need to add some overlay of saying what is what, mainly saying the type of things, but also what led to which outputs and so on. And that is the link data that you put on top there. And that you can use computationally as well to find new connection or to find a particular thing you're looking for. So this is the motivation for the research object, which we started developing uh, in Manchester and with others. Uh, a decade ago now. And now I'm going to skip 10 years of history because we tried a few different ways of doing it with semantic web technologies and so on that maybe got a bit too cumbersome. And now we've kind of gone for a different way of doing it, which is actually not that different, but it is more developer driven rather than cleverness driven, if you could say it like that. So that's the Aura Crate. What is Aura Crate? 
So here I borrowed Peter Sefton's slides, which you can see he's using a much more uh, visual way of explaining things. So the R equate is a way of describing a data set. So a set of data is the core base case. We have a bunch of files and you want to give them some better explanation and then bring in things in the world, right? You want to bring in the project, the people, the software, as I mentioned, or, or funders and so on, and capture that in a better data document that you keep on the side. And then the type of things you have is not just traditional data. It's also all these things in the world. You have instruments, you have uh, institutions, you may have biological samples, all kind of things that you also want to describe are contextualized in the R crate. And ideally they have an identifier, which means you can recognize them when they appear in different R crates. Now, the way it's done is, as I said, it's a metadata format, uh, which is JSON based, and that's the, what's making it machine readable. So that means you can fill in things like, or oh, this crypt cryptically named file actually can be described as, in this case, cute property, because Peter is describing pictures of his, uh, of his dog. But also, you can then render this and say, actually, I also wanted human readable, because I Maybe some of you will be happy reading JSON or even writing it, but most people are, are not that familiar, right? So you need to still to keep the human in the loop. And that is a good argument of, of also having a rendering for the browser of all the metadata. And that's the human readable, I will create preview that we attached on the site. Now we're using this property example, but you can just as well picture, uh, imagine this coming from some instrument reading, for instance, electron microscopes and so on. They're not very famous for having good file names or even uh, open file formats. So adding this level of explanation on top of uh, what comes out of it is an important aspect without you having to sit and rename or, or shuffle things around. So you have also this we are expressing a lightweight provenance for you to, you can do, like I said, now saying you have received this data coming out of an instrument or using this software. And here's the result I got afterwards, expressing this uh, provenance information in a very fairly straightforward way without any of the murky details, right? So you're just saying, you're just making the links, right? You're connecting them together, right? So it's not the massive log of what happened, it's just, it's kind of still for humans, but you can trace it down to see what came from where. And that could help you, for instance, with these uh, cryptic file formats, because now you know which software can deal with it afterwards. Now, when you have this set of data and you have the metadata file on the side, it would be good to package them together and then you can uh, send them around. And uh, our create is kind of neutral to how you do that. We do say how you can do it with things like Bagit or Oxford common file layout, or just to putting it on the web. So it's a bit open-ended how you store it. And we have a few recommendations for, for better ways to do it if you don't, if you're not quite sure. We shall come back to slightly later. Now, I'm not sure how much time we have, but there is some JSON here in case, hands up anyone who wants to see the JSON, or oh, I'll skip it. I'll just do one peek in. Okay, so this is basically, again, this is my take on what you saw before. So you have, there we go, you see the hands up, all right, all right, here we go. So we we have, this is the base case where we have just a bunch of files. So you add in the R create as an additional file in there. Now you see the file name is quite long and it's basically saying R create metadata. And that's because then you know it is start, right? So it's basically our reserve file name. So if you see that file name, you know it's an R create. And that means you can follow our specification to find the different things. And inside of JSON, you have these different blocks, which I'll come back to, which are describing the things in the R crate. Now, in our specification, we list the, the main things we think you might want to include. So here I list all the contextual things like funders and people and so on. Those are the kind of core elements of things we know everyone will need, but they could, you could also specialize this. So it's based on JSON LD. So it's, as Leila mentioned, it's linked data, but we're trying to kind of keep that secret or well, not secret, but kind of, we're not delving into all the linked data details. So you don't need to learn lots of audio. The main thing is just that you have a few magic keywords starting with the at symbol and everything else is just regular JSON. And for knowing which properties and keys to use, we're basing it on schema.org, which is a, 
uh, fairly well-known uh, way to mark up web pages for search engines like Google. And it's not just talking about web pages, there's a, quite a big catalog of different things you can look up there, for instance, status app, which we use. Well, also these, these more normal things like people and organizations, they're all in there. Of course, there's also ice cream shop, which probably you're not going to need them research out with. But we did find that it is a very good starting point for describing things that are general across all the sciences. And here's a taste of the JSON, as I mentioned. So you have this thing in the top, and that's the thing that just makes it linked data. Everything else is just individual blocks that are added. Now, our create is self-described, and that's actually one of the fair principles that you should be self-described. And, and identify what you are. So here we're saying, I am an hour create. And then we have the main block in the middle, which is just listing these individual data items I mentioned. And then each of them are described further on. And then you're using uh, identifiers to do the linking. So while you might be used to JSON being a, a kind of nested tree that you go quite far down in here, we have flattened this to just a flat list. And we can discuss reasons for and against that. But then the main reason is, is that the, each of these entities are on the same level. They are all important, right? We're not promoting some of them to move. We're not saying author are less important than the data they write. So they should all be described, maybe just in four lines like you see here, but they should all be described equally. And here you see how these identifiers can then be matched up and that's how you're basically making linked data. That's all the magic, right? So that you have the same identifier in the block as in the reference from a particular property. Now, sometimes you're lucky and there's already a good URL you can use like ORCID identifiers you've probably heard of. And if you have one of those, then you can just put them in. Otherwise you can use a local identifier like we did with the picture up here. Now we have a lot of tooling for those who don't want to do all this JSON, even for developers, we have bindings for Ruby, JavaScript, Python, and so on. And that helps with getting these uh, kind of templates in some city quite quickly from a programming perspective. And there are also different ways of using it, which I'll go through now quickly. So one simple way in, we shall try to demonstrate towards the end, if you have time, is how you can just get started in the base case where I have a bunch of files and I just want to describe them. So this is then the tool called Describer. So it's just for describing a bunch of things. There are two versions of it. There's the Describer desktop application and then the Describer online, which at the moment you do have to set up on your own little server because that's meant for binding to Microsoft OneDrive and different cloud services like that. Well, the desktop one I'll show you later can be run just on the file system. So here you're dragging and dropping basically in these different elements and you can describe them one by one and you're building that JSON file as you go along. But you can also render this HTML page so you can have a kind of debug view of this that goes along with the JSON file. So here you see uh, that kind of output coming on. So here we have, you see they're basically the same keys here, but it's slightly more human readable. You can click into individual things and see uh, how the different entities or elements have been used. So this is useful as a kind of last resort because if you have uh, not got anything else, then you have still this. And uh, that means this supposedly, well, as long as we have web browser, will will work for a very long time. So you can store this on tape and pick it up again in, in 20 years, and hopefully you will still be able to, to see this bit, right? So basically no infrastructure required. Now, let's look at someone who still do infrastructure because this is, it would be nice to have something more detailed to show. So here's one example using cultural heritage records. This is from uh, uh, our Australian partners who are developing in the Paradisec project, a way of rendering uh, different records of people speaking native languages that are at risk of being uh, extinct basically because there's just a few hundred left talking. So it's very important records of uh, human culture. And here you see this kind of multifaceted media, right? You have uh, recordings of audio, you have some text, you have some annotations of that. So many different resources that are kind of representing the same thing. But you see on the, on the left there are many different contributors, right? So you have collectors, recorders, so, so many different people involved. And so it's actually using our crate underneath the hood, but you don't see it. You're seeing all the metadata surface in a more domain specific way of rendering. But 
uh, it is still our crate underneath. And just until last week, oh, here it is. There is still a secret button where you can actually have a look at all the gory details if you do want to, right? So here, our crate is basically under Reddit. It is helping you track and keep that metadata, but you have application-specific code that can show this more for that particular use case. So that's the kind of way of using our crate as a kind of storage mechanism for your metadata. So you're kind of lifting it out of the database and just storing this as good old files because we know they will keep working. We, we have been using files for some 50 or so years now and keeps working fine as long as we don't change file encoding too often. And it's, it's, you can think of it as a way of liberating yourself from your repository because they all have their databases and so on, but you probably know how painful it can be to move between repositories. And so you, our crate can be a useful exchange mechanism and also a way of uh, keeping the metadata with the data rather than on the, in a different system. Now I did start with workflows and that's something we've been working a lot on in our group. So I'll talk now about the recent project we have, which is called uh, Workflow Hub. This is a repository or more like a registry for workflows in life sciences. So it is a way of sharing workflows and letting others use them. And so discovering them and so on. So lots of different fair aspects coming in for workflows there. Now, the thing is workflows themselves are kind of diverse as you saw there are many different types. So here's one uh, of a Galaxy workflow that someone have registered and they've added a tiny bit of metadata. Hopefully over time they add more metadata by clicking edit and so on in the workflow hub. Now that means you're adding, you're augmenting this workflow, you're giving it more context and so on. And that you can also access programmatically in the hour crate. So it's not trapped in the, in the workflow hub. If say in 10 years time, we don't have funding anymore, we still have all these hour crates with all the metadata captured and we can put them somewhere else. And it's still not, uh, you know, lost somewhere. It's still kept as a important uh, artifact. Now here are the kind of things that we have. So here you see the work, different types of workflows. We had this challenge that there are different workflow system and they're not all using CDVL, but we liked using that as a way of describing the workflow. So we're now using it not as an executable formula, but as a way of just doing that boxes and arrow description of workflows. And we can extract that from these workflows because now we're kind of skipping those details of the command lines and so on. It then it's fairly easy to do for all the different workflow systems. And that means we can render inputs and outputs and so on in a common way. So that means for each workflow, we have a set of different resources and that's what we're gathering in the hour crate so that you can get to the original definition, but also all this derived information. And then we use this in an execution side as well. So we're building services that can consume this R crate and then they can pick the correct workflow engine, depending on the type of workflow and the type of inputs, and then report the output again as provenance in the same way. So you can use it as an exchange mechanism between your services because you have a compound object moving around. So let's talk a bit about computational tools. So when, when you haven't got a workflow, you just like used one tool. So it's fairly straightforward. We say in the website how you can describe that and in describe as well, you can just click a button to do that. But when I say tool, they're not normally that straightforward again. So here's from the BioXL project that is paying for me in my project. So I, I better mention them and and one of the things we've done is to build this, to make these building blocks, which is wrapping uh, computational tools for molecular simulation. So this is run on supercomputers and so on. I had quite uh, high requirements for performance, GPU access and so on. And that means there's a challenge in how we package these tools. So we have lots of different ways of installing them and using them, not just Docker containers, but Conda packages and different ways of accessing them. So you have even just one tool have many different facets in the way. And that's something we are now using our crate for uh, to explore how can we gather them together as one single unit and still uh, not lose information about, for instance, who actually made the tools we have been wrapping and so on. So you have this intermediary, but we also want to propagate the metadata 
of the tool. We don't want to take credit for tools that someone else wrote, right? So that has to do with the software citation as well. Now, what about regulatory sciences? So that's uh, things like the FDA in the US have, they had the very same challenge we saw before with uh, reproducibility. People now using uh, computational methods for uh, medical treatments, for instance, personalized medicine, you take a cancer sample and then you do some sequencing and then now you choose which kind of treatments to do. But then there's a computational element of that. And how do they get approval for this? Well, they used to just send these PDFs in and then they would sit for weeks again and try to recreate the workflow to see if it makes sense. Now they've made uh, a different standard called the, uh, the biocomputer objects, which is a way of describing the inside of the workflow or the purpose of the workflow. So this is from a different perspective than what we do in our crate. So here you're talking more about why do you want to use this workflow? What is the uh, suit of usability domain of that? What are the errors that could happen? So it's talking more about what is the purpose of the workflow. And they have a separate JSON format, which looks like this, if you remove all the curly brackets and add some nice colors. And that's an IEEE standard now. And so we know this exists and we help them with looking at, but what does this mean in terms of all the FAIR principles? Well, they haven't got any slots for orders of the tools or license of the data, all these kind of things. So if you want to say those things, you need a neighboring metadata file of the R crate. So this is an example of having more than one way of expressing the same thing. So you could have one, domain specific representation of something then, and that's often the case that it's already a metadata format, but it doesn't tell you so much about links out in the world or, or citation information and so on, or, or maybe you're doing cross domain and you want to mix things, then our crate can be the glue that stays on the side. And then of course you can only indicate in the our crate that there's also this other metadata file following this particular standard. So you see in the bottom there, we say conforms to this IEEE thing. That means you could programmatically now find the different metadata file and pick the one your software likes the most in a sense. So here's something from the earth sciences where they have challenge of uh, cite citations. So often now they are collecting from repository laws of different satellite images and so on. And they want to give credit as you should but the problem is to get loads of them. Maybe they have 500 images or something and it doesn't fit in, you know, in this traditional PDF format to just add them in the bottom there because they still have page limit. You know, the internet's running out of pages soon. So we have to be careful. And so here the R crate plays a role of some intermediary uh, citata citation reliquary that is kind of placeholder for all the things that you have selected to cite for. So this is almost like an ad hoc collection. So here you are collecting someone else's things because you need to cite them as a group together. So we, we have to move away from these things of collection being of the people owning the things in it. Our crate can be a way of collecting other people's thing. And that's an important thing, a part of the FAIR principles is the reuse elements. Now, when you do a lot of reuse, you have a lot of citations to do. Maybe you have lots of licenses to comply with that says you need to propagate who made what and so on. Now, our crate is the perfect holder for all that because you have all the different slots. And as I said, it doesn't run out of space, right? So we're looking here of even having many thousands and it, it should work fairly well. And then you'd mint a, a DOI for that our crate and use that as your citation. And we're working with open air and how to then still lift up all the underlying ones. Now, Earth Science is also doing uh, dimensional stuff. So here we're talking about data cubes, which is a way of uh, covering uh, where on the earth have you covered something. So they have spatial coverage, temporal coverage and vertical coverage. So even sometimes when you have uh, collected samples out in the rainforest, for instance, it's important to know you know, where in the trees have you been collecting things? And that's what is called the data cube. And they're extending the R crate and adding these dimensional aspects to it as well. And we already had a way of expressing place in, in schema.org, but it's not specific enough. So they needed to be more accurate and you can still specialize R crate in this way. And that is 
what is effectively emerging now is lots of these R create profiles, right? So we have this general way of doing the general things, but each of you, each of the users also go in slightly different direction because they're doing different sciences, they're collecting different things. And those are the R create profiles. So here are basically the same things I did said before, uh, but Carol Global have, they have tried to put them in some kind of systems where you see where they're coming from. And now we're working on ways of formalizing this. So we want to have fairly lightweight formalization because these things are kind of emerging. They're not like, you know, XML schemas or something. There has to be very strict and say only this is allowed and so on, because we still want to have this level of open-endedness where you can still customize as you see one portfolio is actually specializing another one and so on. So here's how we tried to do that with us workflow example. So here's how we started. We had this workflow our create profile, which is basically specializing the our create uh, specification and saying actually there must be a workflow in here. Actually, the, the makes sense if you have an our create of workflow, there must be at least one workflow in there, right? Or maybe there's also this CDL file and so on. Now this is all human readable, but it's not machine readable, right? So it's not quite fair yet. So now we're working at how to formalize that. And the way we're doing that is just as another R create. So we're now having the same thing. I'm now rendering the JSON. But here you have them expressed computationally in the JSON format. So here you see the different requirements listed. But still, this is fairly lightweight. We're not kind of broken it down into musts and should and that level. So, but the, people are asking for that. So we are also uh, gradually formalizing bits where it needs to be formalized. Because of course, uh, when you're consuming these things, you need to make certain assumptions. We talked a bit about fair, and one thing is about how do you access the R crate? So I want to talk briefly about that because we said we were fairly open-ended on that, but in order to actually be fair, you need to be a bit more strict so that you are following uh, good practices. So here's a good overlap with what is also called the fair digital objects, which is, uh, concept that is now making its rounds around the EOSC system and things like that. So the idea there is, is that you have a persistent identifier that then have different aspects to it. You can have uh, an actual data, something you download, some bit sequence that is stored somewhere. There could be a collection and there's a metadata associated. The metadata always being uh, of its own uh, object. And we see how our create kind of fits in fairly well with this because we already have the metadata file. We use DOIs and permalinks for so persistent identifiers. Of course, our create itself can be a collection having many parts to it. And the kind of the, the last missing bit is just about where do you actually store these things. And the, the easiest uh, straightforward one to do this is just upload it to something like Synode, a kind of dumb repository that doesn't understand all of these details. Now, there are better ways to do it, but that's the kind of lowest uh, level of getting started with, we shall look about now. So let's, let's just look about that. How do we do this kind of self-publishing of our crate? So here's an example that is actually me, you know, when I have too many things to do, instead of actually doing them, I start uh, looking at things I should have done years ago instead. So here's one coming from uh, a project called OpenFax, where we had uh, produced lots of link sets for identifying medical entities and so on. And we had lots of nice ways of mapping between them and they, uh, we had made lots of services and software and so on. Now this is back in 2014, you see, and so on. And it, we published all the data, we published all the software, but then, you know, these links, they start dying, right? Because this was fairly large, right? There's many gigabytes and so on. So we, we, we see we're referring to some repositories. We had data, open facts to all. None of those links works now. Now the repository link is a server under my control. So I, it crashed last week, I think. So I, I, I can make it come to live, but they're kind of very fragile, right? So it's not very easy for anyone, not the experts to actually start this up again. And it happens always some students come and say, oh, I want to use this software. How do I get it loaded when these links don't work anymore, right? If I try this link now, it's just gonna time out because that server is, the funding is gone, right? And we never deposited data somewhere. Why didn't we? Well, because it's a collection of aggregated data sets. We were using fair data, but putting them all together and they have many different licenses, then different restrictions on how we can move them about. 
and it was very hard to do that as a single thing. So I'm, oh, hang on, I have it. Yes, here. So here's how I would use this, how I've been using Describer just to do that. So I have a bunch of these files. I can just select that folder. So I had access to that server where we had a mirror of it, which so that means I still had the data, but they were just on my desktop, right? So I just selected the folder and then I started describing. Here you see in Describer, you can fill in uh, these elements. You see buttons for adding in the different persons, organizations, and so on. And then you describe which files to annotate. You see, I ignore some of the files because they probably should not be uh, important. And that's a fully okay. Our create is not necessarily a manifest, it's just a description. So it would be fine to just describe a folder by itself without each of the files inside it being described. And then for each of them, you can do things like here, I'm saying the license on this particular data set. And this is how I'm now going through to, to actually verify uh, this ancient data set so others can now uh, hopefully get in here. See, when I have populated now, you have lots of these different types used in here. And if I just click to render it, and now I get a nice rendering in here. And now I've added in other things as well, like the citations that you needed. So for some of these data set, they said, oh, you need to include a citation, right? So where do you include a citation in a JSON file? Well, in our crate is fairly straightforward because you can add in all the other kind of things like the funder and so on, right? So all the metadata is now captured in here and I can now start uploading it. But while I'm developing this, I'm just like putting this in GitHub and having a rent like this page as well. Now it's just GitHub IO, right? So it is kind of, it's there straight on the web, but it's not quite fair in the sense of having persistent identifier because I mean, I could just change this at any time and then it stops working again, right? So you need to mint some DOIs or permalinks for it to be citable. So here's just how you would do that with Zenodo. You just start uploading. You can upload the zip archive, which you see is just 400 megs in this case. And that's because I included some external references in there as well for those things that have incompatible licenses I just uploaded them separately and then use citation by reference. And this is the, the kind of most lightweight way of going ahead. And if you want to talk more about these kind of things, then please come to the Arcrate community. We have a course, uh, which Leila asked about in the beginning, twice a month. And uh, it's just to sign up on a GitHub issue number one, and then, then you're in, then you're in the club and uh, you can ask any questions. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Stian. So we have uh, now time for questions. So please uh, raise your hand and then I will um, say who can go ahead. Conrad has a question. Oh, I didn't see it. So Conrad, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. And I think this is really a um, a nice and flexible piece that is solving a few things or a few gaps that we that we have and also walking us through um, the practical part is actually also very helpful because i was asking myself if i want to put this on the nodo should i have this inside of of the file or on the same level but you put this on the same level here so that it can be found and that would be actually my next question um do you have already a, a way for discovering these files so do you have something that scrapes, for example, Zenodo or other repositories to make uh, this searchable in a way? So can I, if, if I want to have a list of, let's say, widely, or, or if I want to have an overview of how many people have used this so far for a certain domain or something like this, or let's say on Zenodo or on a certain other repository, is there a way to discover these, these files? And yes. ideally, search for metadata. Yeah, so there's something I didn't get to go so much in detail on is in the fair signposting aspect of the fair digital object, which allow you to, to say that there is a file that is actually following the specification and you can go there to find the metadata for this persistent identifier. Now, the problem with that in these general purpose repositories is that they don't know already about this, right? So they wouldn't expose that. And this is the kind of why we have this fallback option of the the magic file name, because if the file name is our create metadata, it is our create metadata. So, but that's not as discoverable as uh, being in an index and so on. So there's 
Uh, this one year's project we are we are proposed we are writing a proposal right now actually that, that is looking at doing these kind of indexes and catalogs across repositories uh, because you have the advantage of having the common metadata file then you are able to load them up you could put them in a knowledge graph or whatever to index them so we have some students looking at that but we haven't made like a central research object server or, a, or a repository on purpose in a sense because we know they are different they go into different uh, repositories and it's also because we have to then lock down lots of things like is it inside the zip file is it outside the zip file uh, is it is it with baggage is it over this identifier or that identifier and that's why we're locking down in the fair digital object profile for our to kind of make a practical one way of doing it but that's still a bit up in the air because we kind of have to almost like choose some repositories so it's good that we are able to work with uh, uh, Synodo and OpenAir on this so that we can have uh, at least one big repository trying it we're also working with Dataverse which is doing it on on their side mm -hmm. thank you very much there's another question Juliana please yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, I have a question. So how, what, what are the next steps? So we, you have shown a lot of, of tools already which are available, but I would say currently only people really involved in, in our area are able to use them. And what can we do also from the infrastructure perspective uh, to bring that to the normal researcher? What, what would be the next step? So I would assume that the one hand would be what, what Conrad asked, so that we have really an infrastructure where it is very easy to submit exactly. such kind of data and search such kind of data. But 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 would be further steps to make it really that a PhD student is really happy with it and takes only small amount of time to really publish data in such a way or its whole workflow. Yeah, exactly. So you need both ends, really. You have, as you say, uh, the repositories, uh, which we are engaging right now in, and that is to, to surface the metadata in different ways and also to have more, more user-friendly ways of doing it rather than this kind of debug mode that I showed you, uh, because then you can, for instance, fill in things that already exist. Like when I did this, I had to fill in all the licenses by hand, right? But there's a well-known list of of open licenses that people normally use so this kind of extra help is needed and that's typically useful inside a particular repository then you have the same for data producing side so we are uh, also working with the workflow engine so that they can output our crates as i showed you that infrastructure there about uh, the exchange of ex our crates in the execution but that gives you a kind of very low level our credit it is it's a different kind of research object because it has all the execution details and not necessarily know anything about why you want to do something so you need both the help from the computer to to do kind of all the boring things like oh i just use some software and here it is uh, but to to link it into who's doing what or or why you're doing it then the human still needs to do some annotation but again, that could be helped by uh, repositories that, because it appears the same in many of the research outputs in the same project, for instance, right? You will have the same funding every time, right? So you need some help to fill in. So that's also the kind of template system that some have been working on in terms of these profiles in that they are almost like half full, half filled in, right? Like everyone you use will have the same person identifier for you, but maybe the set of colleagues will be different, but you could have a list of them and then you just tick them rather than filling them in every time. There's another question, Eva, and then Konrad again. Eva, please. Yeah, sorry, I needed to um, to unmute myself. So yeah, um, also uh, from my side, uh, uh, thank you for the clear presentation. I, uh, I had the feeling always when a question um, or a very um, deep question came up, you just answered us just a, 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 a minute after it. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, I'm wondering um, 
Uh, how much is it used? So um, is it um, already, um, do you have any any numbers um, if it is widespread used already or because I, I never have uh, heard of it uh, right now and so I, I don't uh, understand because I'm, I'm really convinced that this is a good uh, approach for standard standardization. Um, yeah. It's, it's a fair point that we haven't got widespread use at the moment in terms of uh, thousands of users now. So we have been targeting quite a, a broad set of different uh, domains and, and repositories and services and so on. And each of them will indirectly, in a sense, come with many users. Uh, but we haven't got that many users in the wild, in a sense. But we do occasionally find them, like we found people doing uh, uh, machine-readable data data management plans using our crate, for instance, which we hadn't known about until we did a literacy search. So there are a, a few things that are popping up. In fact, I got an email about another one this morning, but but yeah, it's not ginormously used at the moment. So we need an extra list of how to get it out to the masses. And I think working with, again, the infrastructures and repositories as a way in is an important aspect. And that you see similar already uh, happening kind of at the DOI level, like with data site, which is used by most of the data repositories today, which is collecting the kind of surface level metadata. And, and they have agreed on a common metadata format there, but you haven't got description of what is inside it. And that's where we see the complement of our crate coming in there. Hmm. Yeah, but, 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 but we like have a... kind of stayed a bit to be critical of myself a bit too much for the developer side yeah so we have done a lot of work to be kind of developer friendly but we haven't done too much work except on this describer as i showed you about doing end user stuff right because that it can be but is there any nice. chance that a service like zenodo um would give some recommendation to the users to use um um, um, um the standard yeah, so with Sonoda, we are working in, in two ways. We're working in, in the uh, E3, or this is EOSC Mesh, Mesh project, are working on a way of getting uh, our crate as a way into the repositories. And then we have, we're talking with Martin Fenner, who's also going to work on Invenio, which is the software behind Sonoda, on adding our crate support in there. And as I mentioned, Dataverse as well have received some funding for doing a similar thing on, on the Dataverse. And Dataverse are many different repositories. So then again, it, it's making our query being almost like underwear, but it is exposable, <laughs> a bit more like a swimming wear, right? That you, you can, it, it is there, the details, but you don't need to see them, right? So they, that uh, it's, you can have the commonality between the different repositories. But it's a hard sell because you, you don't want to sell to the repository maker. Oh, we need to make it easy for people to move away from you, from your software because they all want to stay with them. But we have been working with them for a long time. So also we were working with Mendeley Data before, even before we came up with our crate. So we had, and that kind of led a bit to this development later on. Thank you. Conrad, you have another mm -hmm. question? Or yes, you exactly. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. And which builds a little bit upon Eva's uh, question. From your experience, how easy is it to get people so from zero to use this on a on a common practice so or in, or on a required practice? So if uh, I mean we with many people here having a strong IT background, I guess for them it is still maybe a certain gap to think into into the vocabulary. But if you have these kind of people, let's say with a computational background, if you have people let's say with a purely experimental background, do you have any? Any statistics? Can, is it sufficient to give them a half day training? Do they need two days or whatever? And then they usually can get going with this or do you have any yeah, gut feeling regarding that? I, I think not really, just to have, you would only get the basic, like I showed title, auto license, that kind of thing, but not the specialized things for that domain. For that, you need to basically develop your own profile. Someone will need to look a bit more into, you know, the matching schema or type for what you need to do in your research and then select the things that should basically be in the form right so uh, tools like describe can i didn't show that but you can select different profiles in there and that will enable more buttons or, or hide more fields because you you still want to be selective and not give you know the whole uh, recipe book because it's too overwhelming if, if you even looked at schema or there's so many different attributes that are almost the same thing that 
that makes it good for when you you know you want to be a bit more precise, but it can be hard to get started. Like what's the difference between author, creator and contributor or, or publisher, right? That takes a lot of thinking to know these things, but if you just kind of restrict that list and give some more description, that helps. So that's what we've been doing there in, in making these more specialized profiles that then gives you almost like a step-by-step -step forms that you can make. But I think still you need a slight introduction to this kind of uh, graph thinking in a sense or, or of the way of making the different elements to that you fill in and again i said having help from these being pre-filled in uh, reduces that barrier a bit again and good examples help a lot and we need to move away from json examples to more interactive examples mm, yeah thank you thank you yeah, maybe you can accept it, or do you want to say anything happy? no no um, because in principle, I, I think I see a lot of uh, potential here really using this. And I, actually, I had to check because we, I'm not sure if you're aware of NFDI in Germany, so this National Research Data Infrastructure, right? Um, we had this in our proposal. We, we, I, I checked it. We had it, um, but we commented it out later because it needed much of explanation. And it was a solution that, that we were thinking of, but um, we didn't explain this further in there. And we were running short of uh, short of uh, space in there. But I actually see, see a lot of potential using this as a ra rather lightweight approach. Um, and the, the question that I had before: How easy is it to bring this to people? I mean, the, the, even if there is a certain expertise needed, this is maybe where we can bring in some data um, stewards that actually help filling out this kind of stuff at uh, the case of publication and could maybe use the, also lead to a better, better adaptation of this. And as you said, once you have some examples, right, then you can uh, copy paste and adapt some a few things there. So I, I find, find this actually very attractive and it could really um, yeah, uh, we would think how, how we or when we could introduce this. It's actually not yeah. uh, if, and, but we, when actually. Yeah, and that's an important thing about the moving the collection of fair metadata to an earlier step in the research process. So it's not some massive barrier that is there in the last day before you're submitting. It's something you have already done for your own benefit earlier on. And then the last thing you do is just to click mint the UI and then you're done, right? So that the, you have done it bit by bit and been supported by the different tools along the way. And, and that is kind of also why we want to keep it generic. So we're not just, you know, making a new website saying, put all your data with us, right? Because you're never going to win. If you, you might win some users that don't have anywhere else to go, but you're not going to be generic anymore because there's, there's plenty of those things already. And so we like better to work with those and say actually can you also instead of just having everyone your own custom formats could you also just export it in this format and then we can all speak the same language again sounds good yeah. uh juliana has another question yeah the, the point is what i always get back from the research is what what is the win situation what do i win when i invest so much time to annotate my data in such a way so because normally the win of a phd student or a researcher is that uh, you have a high-end publication and that's currently completely independent from the way you put your data and your workflow in so and, and that's that's something if, if we can show people that they have really an advantage when they're doing this that also for for themselves that that would help a lot to to get some adaptations done in this area if some ideas in this direction yeah the important thing to think about that is the consumption right that you have uh, not just you know a, a pretty list of data, metadata to show I, I have organized what i know but also that you have a way of using it that gives something additional so for instance if you have a lot of these, how can you then programmatically collect them together and still have all the licenses so you comply with it or, you know, load them up in Jupyter Notebook, that kind of thing. So, so there again, it, be, it needs to be a bit more domain specific. So for it to actually make sense, because otherwise we're just stuck in this uh, kind of data citation level, which is boring for most people right it's interesting for the on the library side but it's not so interesting for the individual researchers because that's just some tedious thing they need to do so for instance in the workflow 
sorry if I offended and <laughs> but I, I'm one of those who love doing these things, right? But for Workflow Hub, for instance, we, we say that if you want to import your workflow, you upload this and our create, and then you can provide all the metadata in one go, right? So we there the motivation is that you can keep that with your workflow definition and you don't have to go and click on a website and update it anymore. It can stay with your workflow and we just import it whenever you make a new version. And you maybe you even programmatically fill in some things that change over time, and and so it is is a kind of laziness factor in there or, or convenience thing, and and again, it, even for 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 from programmer point of view, it, it's useful as a way of oh I don't know which met, metadata model to pick, right? There's quite a big list of them out there, and then if you don't know, then you probably are not so detailed what you want to capture then it's a good starting point. And as I said, you can put other things on the side there, but but that's not so interesting for, you know, just some PhD student who's just doing some analysis. So again, integration with tools is more useful in there. For instance, in, in workflow system, we're talking about uh, when you use some data that it comes along with the metadata so that you can have your citations ready for when you do that traditional PDF, you can export out uh, what data you used in your research because you gathered it programmatically. It's not something you had to do, the workflow system did it for you. But that we can only do one by one, so it takes a lot of developer effort to do each of those. But the good thing is so that you can have common tools across these uh, for conversion, for, for doing, uh, you know, for moving things from one system to the other. So, Stian, thank you very much. We are running out of time. There are three more minutes left. Maybe there are some other questions. And if it's not the case, I guess Leila can provide your email address or we find it on the net for further questions or contacts. Thank you. Well, even better, join the community call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, unfortunately, they are at awkward times because they are really synchronized with the Australians, so they're either at night time or oh. early in the morning. So they <laughs> okay. alternate between those two. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you for all the good questions. It was a pleasure presenting to all of you. Thank you, Stian. Thank you a lot for your talk. Yeah. Thank. Thanks. Bye bye.